episode five of Refi Podcast, John and I speak with Marcus Frank at C Labs. Marcus Frank is an economist with an incredible background. He understands the nuances of regenerative economics, how to create stable coins, and how to build software that actually makes the power of DeFi accessible to all. Celo is a planet positive layer one blockchain that's built on the proof of stake consensus mechanism. It's very energy efficient and they actually offset all of their carbon emissions and make it a climate positive chain. We hear about the vision for Celo, this ecology of money, natural capital backed assets, and how a universal basic income can be made possible with a mobile first blockchain like Celo. I hope you'll enjoy this one and stay tuned for next week where we've got another episode dropping with an amazing guest. Marcus, welcome to the Refi podcast. How's it going today? Hey, John. Thanks a lot. Amazing that that I can be here and chat with you. Um, yeah, going good. Thank you, Marcus, um, for coming on today. We've done yeah quite a bit of digging into C Labs and into Cello. I had an amazing conversation with Sep a few weeks ago. Um, I spoke to him very early on in the podcast journey, and he said, "You got to read Charles Eisenstein's Sacred Economics, and then let's chat." That's been absolute mind and heart opener for me. So grateful to come across his work and just really excited to dive into the work that you're doing um, at Celo and C Labs. And so just to kick us off, could you help us understand like what is C Labs, what is Celo and kind of the difference between these two organizations and how they work? Yes, I'm happy to do that. Um, so Celo is a layer one blockchain. Um, and I think the three key features of Celo are that it is mobile, open and real. Mobile in that it's a layer one that is mobile first with a focus on adoption via the mobile phone. Open means it's fully open source, it's permissionless. Real means it's, it's actually working on um, real use cases um, to use this technology for remittances, for payments, but also for all sorts of DeFi applications like lending, saving and borrowing. Um, and I think one key thing we will also chat a bit more about um, is that Zello is not only carbon negative on a protocol level, but is also doing more and more in the regenerative space, which is super exciting. And C-Labs is an engineering company, um, so I'm working at C-Labs. Um, I'm an economist. Um, I, I did my training in economics in my previous career. I worked in tr what I would today call traditional finance um, and in research. Um, I have a PhD in economics and and um, and yeah, from the start also working on Cello, I was focusing on economics, the economics of the stability protocol, the stable coins that live on Cello. Um, the name of the stability protocol is Mento, um, but also the economics, for example, of uh, nature backed uh, currencies, um, which is a super exciting development in, in the space. Um, yeah, that's, um, I think, a bit of the difference. Cello is a, a um, large community of uh, developers, for example, now in more than 130 countries. It's a quickly growing community. Um, Cello tries to attract all um, Solidity developers, for example, who want to build mobile first applications. Um, and therefore, maybe you want to build their Ethereum based application also on a different layer one on Cello um, to build for mobile. Um, and, and C Labs is one of these projects that, that works on Cello and provides technology and, and um, yeah, builds different things in, the, in that space. So cool, man. Mm. I came across Cello very early in my climate crypto journey. I was building this directory site trying to figure out who is doing what where. And I remember when I first saw the website, it was quite captivating, the vision and this kind of narrative of money being beautiful and there being this opportunity to design technology in a way that can empower 
you know, those who've been excluded from the financial systems to date. I love this DeFi for the people narrative about having a mobile first blockchain that helps people with mobile phones in the developing world get access to banking services for the first time. So deeply resonant and everybody I seem to meet in the Celo ecosystem seems to be such a wonderful character and have their heart in the right place. So yeah, really looking forward to unpacking the different pieces of work that you're doing here. Specifically for you, Marcus, like which piece of this puzzle are you most deeply involved with and most interested in? Yeah, and I mean, as you said, um, everyone on Celo is is very like mission driven. Um, the mission behind Celo to build a more inclusive financial system um, is is extremely important. Um, building a system that creates conditions for prosperity for everyone. So being very open for the community, building something sustainable, building something inclusive. Um, and, and this also attracted me to, to work on Celo from the start. Um, I think, uh, of course, blockchain technology is extremely powerful. It can change so many things, but uh, building something inclusive here, blockchain technology has a real shot of making a difference. And, and I think this is, this is great. And this is why, why uh, probably many of us are in, in this space. Um, and from the start, I was focused on on all economic questions around um, the stability protocol. So, for example, um, when you go to the white paper section on, on for example, cello.org, you not only find the, the white paper for cello, for the layer one, but also a paper on the economics behind the stability protocol, um, what we what we call Mento. Um, and uh, for me, um, this was super interesting because also there, when building Mento from the start, we had a focus on building something inclusive, something people could use um, very easily, even if they are not blockchain experts. I think you can see this that, for example, today, when you send a Celo dollar or Celo euro or as of this week, actually also a Celo real, Brazilian real, which is super exciting. Um, you can actually pay the gas fees for this transactions, a transaction in the same currency. So you can pay it. If I send you Celo dollar, it settles within five seconds and the gas fees, I can pay them also in Celo dollar and, and they are relatively low. It's less than the basis point. Um, so this is actually uh, something that that end users can use for remittances for for day to day transactions actually so it's not only stable coins that are used in in trading or in other defi ex, um, applications but it's also um, used in in day to day transactions and then secondly building something sustainable so this idea of nature backed currencies excites us from the start and you can find it in in the initial white paper and this is also something i'm currently focused on how can we actually build nature backed currencies on on cello um, how can we we not only want to build seller out as being the layer one of choice for all regenerative um, assets uh, out there um, but we also want to to build out yeah these these nature backed currencies and you mentioned the book of charles eisenstein he he talks about the idea um in that book the original idea and i'm happy to to talk a bit more about this um later on um but yeah this is actually also something i'm i'm focused on and then also building out the stable coins from being a a stable and sustainable platform to a being also a more participatory platform. We want to also add more currencies. Celo Real, I mentioned that, launched this week. This is amazing. Brazil has a huge um, blockchain community. People in Brazil also in day-to-day -day transactions are a bit more used to also use blockchains for tr transactions than maybe we are even in Berlin. Um, and, and in Brazil, uh, a high percentage of, of, of the people living there have access to a mobile phone, but not everyone has access to a bank or to the financial system. And therefore, it makes a lot of sense to also building something that is inclusive by adding a currency um, that, that people in Brazil can, can use and that is stable um, with respect to their local currency. Um, so, yeah, these are the, the topics I'm currently fo focusing on. That's that's fascinating. I, I'd I'd like to delve a little bit deeper into this idea of designing for inclusion, and how it might kind of come into tension with 
the engineering approach, right? So this idea of like a protocol level stable coin seems to me that's probably an outcome of recognizing that um, the user experience of, for example, holding Ether in order to pay transaction fees for kind of remittances in a stable coin like DAI, um, that's just a big barrier to entry for a lot of people. So I love the idea of building a, a protocol level stable coin. Um, but I'm curious how, how you kind of square that tension between um, designing something that's delightful UX and that's intuitive for people when it might require a significant amount more engineering, right? Like what, what conversations have been had within the team and how do you weigh those trade-offs? Yeah, those those are extremely good points, and and um, both points that basically building stable coins into the protocol level. So basically, we call it native stable coins that allow you to pay gas fees in the same currency. I think that was um, that was a, a a very conscious decision because yeah, it it changes the user experience, but still, it was a lot of work, and then also building something more inclusive and and uh, the the path to do that we chose was building for mobile that is also a that was a, a conscious decision but it's also a decision that that um, basically yeah produces a lot of work um, building for for mobile um, on on the first um, item um, basically building um, platform native stable coins, as you said, the user experience is extremely important here. And we actually want to build, when we want to build something inclusive, we want to build for everyone, not only for blockchain experts. And of course, um, when you use Ethereum-based stable coins, when you need a second currency that is volatile, um, it can at times also be very expensive um, to pay for transactions on Ethereum in a volatile currency is probably um, hard for many users. Um, it also, um, yeah, is, 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 is expensive. <laughs> um, and therefore, from the start, we knew, okay, we have to build something where maybe users don't even know that blockchain technology is behind. Um, so one uh, wallet that is live on Celo is, is the Valora wallet. Um, and in Valora, it, it sometimes was called, it's, it's like a, a Venmo experience uh, on, on crypto. And this is actually how it should look like. You, you shouldn't like care too much, um, about the technology or the layer one payment rails where your transaction is happening on. You actually care about that the transaction settles very fast, that the transaction is easy to do. Um, and, and this was therefore extremely important. When we want to be inclusive, we have to build it like so that everybody can, can use it. And then to be inclusive, we thought mobile is the way to go. Um, today, there are more than 6 billion people in the world who have access uh, to a mobile phone. I think there are close to 8 billion mobile devices out there already. Um, and also connectivity um, is better and better in even the most remote regions of the world. I think the worst connectivity is probably here in Berlin. Um, everywhere else in, in, in the world, you, you have uh, decent connectivity um, today. And this is great because there's still 1.6 billion people un or underbanked, 1.1 billion people who don't have access to a government-issued ID. Um, even if you have access to the banking system it can, or traditional system, it can be super expensive. The World Bank, for example, says average fees for remittances are around 6%. If you use the traditional banking system, are around 10%. But if you're living in the worst 15-20% uh, of the corridors, the fees are higher than 20 to 25% which is extreme. Um, and, and here this technology can, can make a big difference. It is more inclusive and it is also faster. Transactions on Celo settle within five seconds. Um, if, if I send you via the traditional banking system, a, a, uh, a bank transfer from 
Berlin to, for example, the US, uh, it takes like three days. It depends if there's a banking holiday in between um, until it settles. And if I want to set, then yeah. send it to, I don't know, Tanzania, for example, I have to pay 25% in fees or something, which is, which is mm. ridiculous. Um, and therefore, I think um, also here, building for mobile was a, a choice for us. It makes it, of course, harder because on the blockchain level, you need to build in a ultra light client support that even with the easiest and cheapest Android phone, you can actually interact with the blockchain. And this is something not easy. I'm I'm not an engineer, but I but I know um, the the cryptographers and the engineers were sweating um, over this uh, problem a lot. Um, but um, I think it's really cool that uh, the Cello blockchain, for example, now allows for very fast synchronization for ultra light clients. Even with a simple Android phone, you can can interact with the blockchain. And. You know, for me as a user, when I first downloaded Valora, I was kind of surprised. I was like, wow, you can't even tell this is blockchain. It's so simple. I put in my phone number. People can discover me by my phone number. I don't have this awkward public key, private key, stressful setup. I can just, you know, convert my fiat into Celo or CUSD or CUR. Now you've got the um, Brazilian stablecoin, which is amazing. And I can start sending money to and from my friends. And then it sounds like you guys have been um, quite fresh into the decentralized finance side of building these dApps on top of it. I know now you have a kind of automated market maker on Celo. I know Impact Market allows a kind of decentralized universal basic income for people like myself to say, hey, I'd love to give money directly to people in a refugee camp in the other part of the world um, and know that there's minimal interference from intermediaries like what else is being built on cello right now that's kind of redesigning these financial systems yeah, and impact market is an amazing example it's i think like in, right now the largest universal basic income project in the world um, it already gives ubi in 140 or even more communities around the world um, in, uh, in I think, close to 30 countries. So it's really, really cool to see that um, in, these, uh, in these communities around the world, people are actually now receiving a UBI and they can use it for many different things. They can use it then, of course, for transactions and pay something with it, nice, but they can also start to save or to lend and borrow and actually, actually basically get used to these um, financial primitives um, that, that, that we are used to, um, but, but many people in the world are, are maybe not. And, and therefore, it's, it's amazing to see that they um, give um, so many people access. Um, but, I mean, um, Celo is not only a stablecoin project and it's not only a regenerative asset project and not only a a um a like charity project for example there's so many more really cool things um happening as well and this is i think what what people um when when cello uh, came to to life uh, probably didn't see it actually can be anything else because it's yeah it's a layer one and you can build anything on top of it um, so, for example, a few weeks ago, uh, the funding platform Kickstarter announced that they are um, fully decentralizing their funding platform and they are doing that on Celo. And I think it's amazing because it's really cool that now these um, these large projects um, understand Celo as a layer one that is mobile first and it is inclusive and it is sustainable. And it is also fast and scalable, and therefore we we should build um, build on top of it. And um, um, Kickstarter platform is is really cool um, because it it funds and helps funding a lot of super interesting uh, projects around the world. So I think that is that is also nice. And also in the DeFi space, I mean, in the beginning, um, probably Celo communities discussed it at least a lot. Is, is basically DeFi for us um, as a community also the place to be because when we build for financial inclusion, maybe um, the people in, uh, in, in certain countries don't care too much about uh, DeFi marketplaces. 
that is actually not the case. It was really good to see that now DeFi is coming to Celo. For example, SushiSwap is live on Celo. There are super interesting projects like Mula Market, lending and borrowing on Celo. Um, there's there's uh, Uberswap, for example, as a DEX and, and others. Um, and actually, to, to be inclusive, we need this liquidity that comes with uh, DeFi. And, and um, we need um, all these, again, financial primitives, lending and borrowing in a very, very efficient way on Celo. And therefore, it's amazing that, that DeFi for the people is now coming and actually with a focus to also bring other users of DeFi into the whole space um, by, by making it more open, making it mobile. Um, again, here, um, this, this mobile first also holds true for, um, for the DeFi initiative. And, and I think um, that, is, that is great. Um, and then I think going forward, also the whole regenerative space, um, it, it would be so cool to see um, DeFi like marketplaces on Celo for regenerative assets. Um, and the Climate Collective um, on Celo is, is working on that to bring and attract more climate related projects to Celo that want to build something nice, um, uh, tokenize uh, regenerative assets, um, and, and use the blockchain as a layer one of choice um, for these types of things. Mm. We are um, two at uh, Toucan. We're members of the Climate Collective, and actually, my main side project, Astral, is also a member. So we're very familiar and really quite excited about the work going on there. Um, a Collectivo framework. Um, we're hoping to have some people from Collectivo on to talk about these local uh, regenerative finance framework. Um, I just want to push on one quick thing you you said. You said having the DeFi liquidity is really important for inclusion. Why? Yeah, I mean, um, let's say, for example, for the stable coins, the large stable coins out there, the dollar based stable coins, the fiat backed ones that we all know um, that are out there and have amazing liquidity. They are, they have this huge liquidity because of trading. Um, people use it typically, uh, yeah, to, to have, for example, a lower volatility position, um, when they are trading in the crypto, in the heavy, uh, volat volatile crypto markets. And compared to, other crypto assets out there, of course, these stable coins are less volatile and therefore it doesn't matter that they are just dollar based. I think um, one reason now that more and more people should also get their local currencies or, or their currencies um, as a stable coin and should get access to it is because this space is also evolving. Um, people in um, Brazil, for example, maybe also want to hedge their their holdings or want to de-risk their holdings with respect to their local currency. And therefore, one um, uh, one very interesting uh, development is we will see more currencies also on, on, on the seller stability protocol Mento. I think that is um, one development. And then like to bring liquid, for example, stable coins to every country in the world, um, of course, there could be a centralized market maker that has a lot of money and says, okay, now I'm going to Brazil and afterwards maybe I go to the Philippines and provide liquidity there so that the people there, if they want to start with lending and borrowing or want to start with saving, find the liquidity in these in these local stable coins. However, that would be a centralized effort. And also here in the spirit of decentralization, I think it's the better solution to have these DeFi marketplaces helping with liquidity so that we can actually build inclusive, give as many as uh, possible people access to these inclusive solutions, and then basically find a, a liquid system. And, and if there's strong liquidity in the DeFi space, and if there's like a lot of lending and borrowing going on, and if we build, if we are able to build these lending and borrowing applications in a very inclusive and easy to use mobile first way, then actually people everywhere in the world, as long as they have a mobile phone, they actually could get a business loan um, on, on Celo in Celo Dollar or in Celo Real or in Celo Peso in the future and, and, and can, can build a, a business. Um, and, and I think there, 
DeFi actually um, helps with like uh, significant liquidity. Um, and there, this like heavy liquidity that is currently mostly used for playing around and trading and speculation um, can then actually be uh, yeah put to productive uh, use. So cool. I, I think it's so fascinating to me because I had no background in finance to understand actually the components of our financial system from the lens of decentralized finance because you start to kind of re-engineer and build things from the bottom up. And just to deconstruct a few of those elements, you know, you've in order to make a market, you have obviously the demand side and the supply side, but then you have this pool of money in the middle that enables the transactions between the two. And these automated market makers, AMMs, are algorithms that can take large sums of money and facilitate those trades automatically. And, you know, the deeper those pools are, the more liquid, the more money that's in them, the less slippage there is, meaning, um, you know, the price difference when you're trading pairs of assets and therefore the more efficient the market is. And, you know, the idea that capital flows to its most efficient vehicles um, is one that seems to kind of be quite a, a strong principle here. And I guess what I'm curious to learn more about is there's been, you know, the DeFi 1.0 evolution was heavily framed from the perspective of, you know, yield farming and mining liquidity rewards. And it was very con concentrated on Ethereum layer one. And then, you know, gas fees went through the roof. It got quite expensive. Um, NFTs became a thing even more expensive. And then the likes of Avalanche and Solana and these other platforms have opened up with really strong liquidity mining incentives, which are fundamentally unsustainable, right? There are these protocols who have pools of money who are saying, we'll give you, you know, huge APYs, huge annual percentage yield to put your money in the form of liquidity in this pool for a time. And I think what we've all seen is it's very um, kind of shark-like. And when the yield goes down, the liquidity leaves as well. And obviously, Solo is mission-driven. You guys have really deep values and a very strong um, vision for the future. How are you looking at bringing liquidity onto Solo um, in a sustainable way long-term? Yeah, I think these are really, really good points that like in, in most of these like DeFi initiatives in the past, we've seen this is not sustainable, either because of gas and transaction fees or because of incentives running out or because also of yeah creating a new token for incentives. Um, and then at some point, um, if the token doesn't have any other economic value, um, yeah, a, a deteriorating um, token price and, and basically people um, again um, losing, uh, losing money. I think DeFi for the people from the start um, had uh, this, this mission of making DeFi accessible to any mobile phone user around the world. So bringing more people into the system, bringing more end users into the system, which already allows not or which not only is uh, is a bit more inclusive, but also it allows uh, for more, yeah, let's say real world use cases. I mean, so far in lending and borrowing uh, in the DeFi space, there's no real yeah, sustainable economic value add because there's no, for example, transformation of risk or transformation of maturity um, or, or transformation of liquidity. If you are, for example, if you want to buy a house, you actually transform uh, liquidity uh, and, and, and in a way maturity by transforming your future income in a, a today's liquidity in form of a, a loan um, that helps you to buy the house. And there's something that, that didn't happen in DeFi so far. And this is changing now, which is really exciting. Um, and, and therefore, it's not only cool that we see um, yeah, all these, these DeFi platforms coming on to sell or if you go on the DeFi for the People webpage, you can see um, like Pool and Sushi and Aave and Curve and others there. I think this is this is super exciting. But I also think um, this is really a, a great way how this can, for example, be used to finance universal basic income via impact market. This can be used in many different markets um, so that people actually take the loan 
um, on a DeFi platform, like for example, Moola, um, to then build a business in their local country. Um, it would be absolutely amazing to see more projects building local um, solutions and, and wallets that allow you to build up a credit history, for example. Um, one thing that, that Cello with its mobile first nature has is this nice feature that your your mobile phone number becomes some sort of an identity solution, basically. So you can, as you said, in Valora, you can find other users of the Cello blockchain just via your phone book and send them a transaction. But it could also be used to build up a credit history. It could also be used to build up trust in many different um, different applications. And and the mobile phone number in some regions of the world is the only way of of like uh, yeah finding or identifying um, others uh, in, on a on a on a platform. Um, and and therefore, I think this actually currently uh, opens up so many possibilities um, that yeah I'm really excited to see what's next and then having something like Kickstarter coming to to Cello and then also allowing like large fundraising campaigns um, with your mobile phone on a decentralized blockchain actually allowing fundraising then in future in every region of the world on a sustainable blockchain this is really uh, exciting and and again brings more users into the system and this is where I see that that some economic value is is created in a more sustainable way. Hmm. Yeah, I, I guess what kind of springs to mind as I'm listening to you talk is just this sense that very sophisticated financial products can now be accessible to anybody on the planet. And um, products that currently you have to have a special license for or certain connections or a certain level of education um, to bring the benefits of those kind of financial innovations we've conceived of. I think that's so powerful. And I think, you know, a counter argument by, might be like, well, there's a reason why you have to have a license because this is risky. And, you know, and I think, I mean, on one hand, it's like, well, I think that might be kind of a bit overblown. And I also feel um, that's also potentially a user experience design challenge, right? Like a foreign exchange market and the sushi interface is fun and beautiful and delightful to use. Um, it, but I, it, it also makes me think like one maybe counter argument to this that would play into this sort of common narrative around crypto is like, this is super volatile. And if we're connecting um, kind of the global South and people that are in these kind of more um, low, lower levels of income, lower levels of savings to this very risky financial market, we're exposing them. It's very, you know, a lot of time, in a lot of ways, crypto is gambling and that could be very destructive. So I'm curious what kind of conversations you've been having um, about and like what designs use decisions have been made within Celo to balance the trade-offs there between um, kind of empowering people to participate and like have the individual autonomy to choose, but also mitigating risks that might come from getting really permissionless access to some of these very risky financial system uh, f f aspects of the financial system. Does that make sense? <laughs> I fully agree and, and extremely good. Yeah, makes makes a lot of sense. Um, extremely good points. And I mean, you've also seen in the traditional finance world, the biggest financial crisis always came when when people didn't understand what they were doing. I mean, in 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 uh, when when uh, even banks didn't understand what they were trading in uh, in the subprime uh, crisis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, that that uh, that was like uh, extreme risk that almost brought the traditional finance um, world to an end. And and it was in the end just based on people didn't understand what they are doing and, and trading and, and what kind of assets and risks they are holding. Um, and therefore, I think, of course, when when building something more inclusive and when um, allowing or, or offering an um, more people access to a to a system i think that also comes with the obligation to 
to educate people on how how this works and and um, what the risks are, what the involved risks are, and a part of the solution, of course, again, as as uh, yeah, in our industry, actually lies within being open source, being permissionless, and with open source, allowing those who can read code or who can audit smart contracts actually doing that because it's open source and everyone can point out mistakes or flaws in in the system and i think this is this is uh, this is already extremely important um a second part is even if it is open source um yeah sometimes it takes uh, it takes time until people uncover risks and we've seen with some folks even with stable coins we've seen tremendous downward spirals of certain stable coin systems we've seen attacks that brought uh, stable coins uh, to yeah the brink of of, of fail uh, we we saw attacks on yeah not stable assets in the in the in the blockchain world um that that brought extreme volatility and here i think of course the the whole industry um, has to mature we have to do what we can to add research to build stable systems um, i think as i said open source is just and building building with the community is the way to go um, because that's the only way how you can actually bring many different perspectives into it and and uh, and uncover uh, many different hidden risks um, and uh, for example, when we when we built the Celo um, stability protocol, Mento, we invested a lot in in doing research. And basically, before we build anything, um, building a simulation toolset that allows us to simulate the stability protocol in uh, millions of different market environments, um, basically not using this very short history of the crypto market as as input to 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 learn and to calibrate a system but also using for example stochastic processes um, to to simulate random paths and therefore simulate every possible market environment and see what the stability protocol does um, you can read about these simulations in um, the simulation analysis white paper which is also on the on the white paper page on on cello.org um, and and i think doing this research also working together with research institutions um, is is extremely important and then also working with projects on the ground that understand local risks is extremely important the cello foundation is now giving grants to like all these 130 and 140 countries where where developer are building on cello um, we are trying to hire ecosystem leads in all these countries that basically help um, the community to educate how this works um, it's a huge effort um, but uh, yeah it's it's an exciting effort um, and, and therefore yeah uh, it's it's still a lot of work and be curious to hear you unpack this uh, Provo project that you guys have released recently. Yes, um, Provo is also super interesting because not only the decentralized world is looking into this technology, also the centralized world is looking into this technology, so namely the central banks around the world. Central banks actually know um, they built a not super inclusive system. They actually know they did a poor job on in inclusion. However, they also have a elected mandate on uh, for like in many countries granting financial stability. If they fulfill this mandate, is is a question that will be answered very differently in in different countries i would guess in in berlin it will be answered differently than if you were in argentina for example uh, people would have a different view um, on on the work of the central bank um, but central banks also look into this technology i think central banks have understood 
that they should also consider public ledgers for central bank digital currencies because they actually would benefit from interoperability, they would benefit from bridges, they would benefit from an ecosystem of developers that are also built um, on this uh, technology. Um, however, central banks still fear that they are losing power, that they are losing control, and they actually that they don't fully understand the technology behind. And therefore, Provo, which is um, a, a sandbox for central banks, um, allows central banks to easily try out this technology, to easily, with a click of a button, create a central bank digital currency on a separate testnet. Um, and then see how transactions actually look like, where they could build, for example, um, some transaction supervisory functions um, and, and what, um, what transparency they actually would, would have with this. So I think Provo is also an interesting um, approach to, to, again, educate um, here, um, in, in this case, educate the central banking landscape, how this technology could actually help them. And in your vision of the future, does your stablecoin kind of portfolio sit alongside central bank digital currencies? Or if, you know, the central bank of Brazil came to you and said, we want a CBDC on Celo, would you, you know, exit the market? Like, how is this going to work when these two things come together? And I, that's an excellent question. I actually think the amazing thing about this technology is that it finally now allows for competition between currency and competition in a way so that it creates actually actual innovation. Um, when we look at money itself as a technology, we haven't seen too much innovation over the last uh, few hundred years. I mean, in, in Berlin, still many people prefer cash and cash still has a lot of the same features it had like hundreds of years ago. It's like coins and printed uh, paper um, and 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 people use it to exchange goods. This technology now finally allows for innovation, and and this is based on competition. So I actually see in future different types of currencies competing. I actually see in future a lot of room for for many different types of currencies, global and local local currencies, um, certain use case currencies. Um, central bank digital currencies where the central banks um, then using this technology now would have so many more features to exercise uh, monetary policy. They could very directly measure velocity of money in certain regions and then very directly influence and incentivize um, transaction in certain regions, for example, which is amazing um, because it broadens the toolkit of, of monetary policy. But at the same time, these central bank digital currencies would compete with other digital currencies, um, maybe, for example, with nature-backed currencies um, and, and nature-backed currencies that have certain features that help the planet and the environment. And therefore, maybe some people would rather like to take a nature-backed currency for a transaction or a, even a local currency that is just valid in their local community or a use case currency which connects um, Internet of Things devices. So I actually see room for many different types of currencies, and I actually see also competition between these types of currencies. So it's for me, it's fully, fully fine um, for central banks to enter this market and, and also create their, their currencies in, in, with this technology. Marcus would really like to dive into this whole world of um nature-backed currencies. But I want to start first with how money is today. Um, so one of the amazing ideas I took from Sacred Economics by Charles Eisenstein was this concept that in the current monetary system, money is basically created when natural capital or human capital is depleted in some form or fashion. And so let's just start there and see if I've understood that assertion correctly, and then maybe we can transition into the role that natural capital currencies can play in, you know, helping regenerate the earth and restore balance. 
Yes, uh, happy happy to talk about that um, and, and happy to go into that. I think especially in the book, um, it's now like already a long time ago when I, when I, when I read it, but he goes into that um, where he talks about, for example, that in, in the current uh, system today, for example, money is uh, brought into existence via debt. Um, and this is currently the major... Uh, way how money is brought into existence, either by central banks borrowing money, uh, commercial banks borrowing money from a central bank, the central bank borrowing money from um, um, the the um, people, um, or uh, for example, people using credit cards to pay for goods and and creating new debt. And with this technology, we now actually could bring money into existence via different, um, in different ways. It could be gifted into existence, which is, which is nice. Um, the, the gift economy that, that has to do something with, for example, usual, uh, universal basic income and, and what the work that impact market is doing, for example. Um, but it could also be uh, created into existence via via nature and and planting trees and and um, and and therefore I think it's it's exciting to think about um, how uh, yeah how this technology now gives us more features how man- money can can brought into existence. Okay, so before we move on, I just want to really try to grasp this because. Just like John, I don't have a finance and economics background, or you might have an economics background, but not a finance one. But um, when you say that money comes into existence, when it's like it's brought into existence via debt, can you just like, where does it actually come from? Right? Like it's, it's, it's created by the central bank and given to the, it's, it's, comes from the people this is something yeah, i have on- i mean it is of course a complex um problem um how how central banks uh, work but in the end the way how central banks do monetary policy is in the end they set interest rates um and with these interest rates um there's you have a price um how commercial banks that actually could borrow money at a central bank and then use this again for loans to um, to to the private sector and and also to 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 companies, and basically then um, the commercial banks try to, for example, um, give loans uh, to projects that that uh, build something of value that has economic value. So if you then think about it, the way how central banks can can do monetary policy, for example, changing the interest rate is very indirect. First of all, they don't really know what the velocity of money is. They can estimate this via um, the gross domestic product, um, basically the, the production and consumption in, in a country. So they can only estimate this and then they can incentivize only via changing the interest rates um, for for commercial banks. And then hoping that commercial banks actually give loans for something productive to businesses. So it's a very, very indirect cycle. Um, and the cycle is based on debt. So um, if, um, as we've seen over the last years, central banks lower and lower the interest rates here in Europe, we have negative interest rates already. Um, that it is basically to incentivize people to make debt to create something productive, um, and and sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't, um, and and um, therefore already I think with this technology we now have many more f- um, ways how central banks can do monetary policy. There's this concept by this um, um, Austrian um, economist um, that did an experiment in a town in Austria in Virgil. This, this concept of demerage. Demerage is basically a charge on money when money is not transacted. Um, so it's not like an interest rate that is a um, overall cost of money. It's a very like a uh, direct charge if there's no transaction. So if people hold on to money in Virgil, um, uh, basically uh, you 
you had to transact to get a certain stamp on your uh, on your bill um, on on the money you were using um, to um, yeah to actually uh, to not lose um, value um, and and therefore it was a very direct incentive to do transactions um, and and this experiment took place uh, during the Great Depression um, and it actually helped for a really really growing economy in that town until the central bank then shut down um, uh, this this experiment but it was extremely interesting um, to see that um, these experiments were very successful um, but they they were, weren't carried out a lot um, because yeah it is uh, quite difficult um, uh, at least in the past, um, to do this, um, and and Silvio Gsell, who who did this experiment in in Virgil, um, I think he was one of the few people who tried out a demerge charge on money. And now, um, the technology blockchain and the concept of tokens actually allows us to to do this again. You could very directly incentivize transactions. Um, so I think. The technology just now give us more potential features, um, not only to create money into existence, but also for like how we use money um, itself. Just to recap, um, in the current form of uh, our financial system, money is created through interest-bearing debt, effectively by changing numbers on a computer, where a central bank says, hey, commercial bank, you can have a billion dollars at, say, 1% interest, and you go out and then lend that billion dollars that's in your computer to other people at 1% interest plus whatever additional interest that you get. And the growth of the economy is predicated upon people being able to um, create value in the form of products and services that then repay that interest and you know, settle that debt. And the challenge that we've seen is when we cascade debt upon debt upon debt with currencies that aren't backed by anything, we have this challenge when the economy isn't growing at the rate of interest that things start to topple over because people begin to default in their loans and everything collapses back to the origin of the central bank and, you know, the integrity of money is called into question. And the way that we've currently been dealing with this is just by printing more money and adding more stimulus and pushing the economy forward. And so I'm curious to understand, in your mind, you framed this concept of demurrage, which Charles Eisenstein posits as the kind of um, natural tether to money which has uh, not existed in recent history because we've created a system of money that's growing infinitely. And there's nothing else in the natural world that grows infinitely, right? Everything else decays. And so through demurrage, we now have this connection to the natural world and that money does decay like everything else. But how do you see the idea of natural backed currencies playing into this whole kind of regenerative economic system that you guys are building? Yeah, happy happy to chat about that. And and before we do that, actually, it's extremely interesting uh, to to just briefly also talk about um, this concept of growth. And in our traditional economic system, growth is and and actually economic health is just defined in terms of production growth or consumption growth, and it fully dismisses any cost of pollution, for example, that comes with it any cost of natural resource consumption that comes with it, all these in our traditional system are actually externalities. Um, and, and, and basically, uh, this in the end has, has a horrible effect on, on the planet. So when we think about creating a new financial system, we actually should try to build a system um, where we um, bring these costs of pollution, of natural resource consumption, back into the system, not having them as externality, externalities, but also having them um, directly inside um, the system. And natural capital-backed currencies are actually a way um, to do that. This, this idea, um, also in the book, Sacred Economics, comes from this observation that whatever backs money, people tend to do more of or make more of. Um, so, for example, when gold backed the dollar, people started to mint gold because it's like printing money. Um, and there was a direct incentive, actually, to, to mint gold. So if we 
could use this technology, if we could use Celo or blockchain technology um, to to back money with things we would like to see more of, we can create a very direct incentive, um, for example, to plant a tree if we back money with trees or collateralize money with trees. And therefore, I think from an economic perspective, this is really nice. It sets a very direct incentive to care more for, for nature. You could think about backing money with trees, backing money with a tokenized carbon credit, backing money with uh, clean air, clean water, um, all these things things we would like to see more of and therefore basically not only bringing the cost of pollution into the system but basically setting the right incentive um, to for example plant trees or to to um, build or plant something that creates a carbon credit um, and therefore i like this idea um, a lot mm -hmm. likewise i i think it's one of the most powerful ideas i've come across, which I think means there's obviously double-edged swords and some some real threats that kind of raise with it. And I've had some very interesting conversations with some friends who raise the counter argument that this is, we should not financialize nature, right? Like, what's the difference between backing money with trees and putting a price on a forest? Um, thinking about a threat model, right? Like, Let's say you're a corporate and you, I know you hold a tokenized forest in your treasury. It might be economically ma rational for me to go burn that forest down because that's me kind of removing some of the value from your treasury. So how, like just to kind of dig a little deeper right now, right? Like what, how can we, what, what is your thinking around how we design these natural cap capital backed currencies so that we mitigate these risks that come from financializing nature and and do actually kind of create the a system that does what you're saying which i think is you know if we can do what yeah, you're talking about that's i mean these brilliant. are it's super just, interesting you know, points if, and right? i think if there would be an incentive to to burn the the forest down then we would be setting the wrong incentives uh, in the end so i think first of all when we when we design a system then we should like do this in a way where we like set the right incentives and and some of these things are harder and some of these things are easier um, i think just this technology gives us now um, many more uh, ways how we how we could design these um, incentives and um, maybe this is for example easier in already existing markets like the carbon credit market there is an existing carbon credit market there are first <clears throat> platforms and databases which um, which try to increase transparency in this market. I think blockchain technology actually can increase this transparency and can um, can uh, help us to build even better carbon credits out there. Also, it might be easier to tokenize a tree in a country or an area where um, ownership already is a concept that 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 counts something. Um, basically, if it is probably easier in Canada to tokenize a tree where I can relat be relatively sure that the tree is still there tomorrow than in some countries where I might need an army to defend the forest um, where this tokenized tree is, is in there. Um, the cool thing about tokenization and about blockchain is it, it allows me to do both. Um, it, it actually allows me to talk or do all of it. It allows me to tokenize carbon credit um, and make the carbon credit market uh, a bit more transparent. It also allows me to tokenize a tree in different regions and maybe attach to this token certain conditions, uh, certain mm, um, uh, yeah, for example, attach a staking reward to uh, to uh, that can be earned if people take care that the tree uh, is still alive and is not burned down and is maybe uh, in a way taken care of. Um, so I think, um, yeah, as you said, there are again risks in in in, in doing that. And uh, but I think uh, 
providing a way how, for example, there can be ownership in these natural resources and also providing a way how the right incentives can be set so that these natural resources can be like taken care of, um, I think is, is, is a nice thing. And so practically speaking, you have these stable coins on Celo, CUSD, CUR, and you said CRIA. Um, so people are using these stable coins to fulfill you know, normal monetary functions, lending, borrowing, paying for products and services. And right now you said you have a kind of stability protocol that looks at how do you maintain that stable coins peg to the fiat equivalent. And you guys have done a very sophisticated exploration of how to fulfill that. But in essence, you're backing those currencies with other assets, right? And so um, help us understand like the role that these natural capital assets have in backing these stable coins. And what assets are we talking about? What's the process of bringing these natural capital assets on chain? And what role do they play in the basket of currencies that are backing these stable coins? Yeah, you're fully, fully right. Um, so Mentor, the name of the stability protocol is an algorithmic stability protocol. There is smart contracts that can expand or contract the amount of stable coins in circulation, depending on demand and with it, keeping the price stable. Now, expanding is easy. Contracting, you need something else to contract with. And for this, there's a, a reserve that collateralizes these um, stable coins. And in this reserve, um, there are many different assets. Um, I actually believe in multi uh, asset reserves um, because then the risk of of a downward spiral when everything is based on just one reserve asset is is diversified in in a way. And in this reserve currently, there's um, the Celo governance token. Um, there's also other. Uh, currently other uh, currencies like uh, Bitcoin and ETH, there's also a uh, tokenized carbon credit in this reserve. And the vision for this reserve is actually that the share of these tokenized regenerative assets uh, will be much higher in, in future and hopefully very high um, soon. And, um, and uh, with this vision, we first of all, of course, want to incentivize in a way um, all these projects out there hey if you actually working in this field you should consider building tokenized regenerative assets um, because then in future with this reserve we actually have a buyer for these assets so for you um, as a project working in this space it is an additional incentive not only to basically do something good for the environment but also here is a buyer for these types of assets. Then the nice thing about this mechanism is that if um, there is more demand for these Mento stable coins, if, for example, the community in Brazil is exploding and, and there are so many projects that use these stable coins to sell a real for many different use cases, or if um, the Deutsche Telekom and T-Mobile go live and enable all their T-Mobile users around the world to send remittances um, via Celo stablecoins. With this increased demand um, for stablecoins, this allocation to regenerative asset in the reserve would grow because then the supply of these, these stablecoins grows. And with growth in the supply of these stablecoins, then the reserve itself also grows. And therefore, we have this incentive um, we've talked about that basically more demand for for stablecoins, for example, leads to more demand of something we would like to see more of, um, regenerative assets. And therefore, we have this positive uh, feedback uh, mechanism. And so if we just drill into the case in Brazil, it would mean the opportunity to potentially acquire some land that's at risk of deforestation in the Amazon nearby in this local community. And... How is that brought on chain? How would the tokenization happen? How is it fractionalized? How is liquidity dealt with? Are there secondary markets that emerge? Like, you know, what does this look like? And actually here, um, I mean, I was focused uh, a lot on uh, the stability protocol and, and basically building out the stability protocol in, in, uh, in the past. And actually here now, uh, probably 
you and Tukan and the Climate Collective are the experts, or what would be um, the the best ways how to tokenize this? I think for for the reserve or for the stable coins, um, it would be um, very interesting if we if we bring solutions online that are in in a certain way decentralized, that are in a certain way transparent. So that basically the community, if they would like to, could actually look into these tokens and see what's behind and actually see, oh, wow, there's real land behind or real trees behind or real like regenerative assets behind that. And and therefore, um, these, these stable coins are not really cool to do transaction with. They, they are also backed with something really, really cool. So I can tell you a little bit about what we're thinking about um, how to kind of create these natural capital backed assets, tokenized assets um, from the perspective of the climate collective. And I'm mainly speaking with my astral hat on right now. Um, so I've been working on this project for a while called the astral protocol, and we're trying to look ahead and um, anticipate a new category of decentralized applications that use spatial and location data. Um, Ethereum is, or blockchains are global by nature. And it's like, that's a really good thing, right? Like that's how they can be so inclusive. This idea of me sending my money to the U S and it taking three days is ridiculous. Like where's my money? Is it on a plane? No. It's a, so this instant global settlement is kind of a feature of money that has fully de dematerialized and has become kind of internet native and finally graduated to its role as an information technology, which I think it always fundamentally was. Um, but what we, we kind of are missing is how can we tie real world situations to smart contracts and how can we tie smart contract behavior to local areas. And so one line of research at Astral is thinking about essentially how can we, because because what we're talking about is the Oracle problem fundamentally, right? Like we've got a token, this is supposed to represent one ton of carbon or one tree or one acre of wetland or whatever it may be. And the value of that token is derived from the health of that ecosystem, we need to have some, as you say, transparent, decentralized, trust minimized, verifiable way to get the information about the health of that natural capital on chain so that we can accurately assess the value of the token. And essentially, this is coming down to we, we want to look at these um, ecosystems. So we're, we're building a pilot right now with the Collectivo um, project, which is um, tokenizing food forests in Curaçao. And they're, they're trying to build a regenerative economy in the island of Curaçao. And what we're, we're just kind of breaking ground on this proof of concept. But the idea here is to assess the health of these food forests by looking at them from three perspectives. The first is, and the most important, and I think especially early on, the most important is people. The people who are there with a close connection with the land, there every day. And this would be basically in the form of them filling out like surveys designed with ecologists, to, um, maybe taking photos saying the growth is happening, this leaves are getting brown, the soil is kind of dry, taking um, physical measurements as well of soil chemistry, water, etc., that being one kind of data stream coming in. And then the two other supporting perspectives are from, from physical sensors. So one would be um, Internet of Things devices that are measuring conditions within the forest. And then obviously remote sensors that are flying over. Maybe those are drones. Maybe those are satellites that are taking pictures. Um, and then you essentially take these three information streams and process them using these sophisticated analytics techniques that are kind of independent of blockchain, right? These machine learning techniques for assessing carbon levels in the soil or vegetation index, this kind of thing. The idea here is with those three perspectives, we can reach a reasonably defensible conclusion that, okay, this forest is still here and the health is this. And um, the real trick is how can we 
kind of create the system in a way that's trust minimized and verifiable. And a, a big line of, of the research we're doing there is how do we put these, um, essentially like the data that's captured in the process of measuring the, f the physical characteristics of these environments onto a Web3 native storage system like IPFS so that you can essentially link that to the, at the smart contract level and people can go verify and say, cool, I can see the sequence of drone pictures from the last 10 years. And, you know, this is, we can trend the, the health. And then I think part of what's so, so exciting about this to me is what, and what Collectivo is working on is the, the monetary policy that you can then design when you have these, what essentially are going to be leading indicators of the deterioration of ecological health coming into the smart contract system. You can trigger things like a rebase or tapping into a treasury and deploying capital. So they're, they're really working with this idea of like underwriting natural capital using like a parametric risk management system. Um, if the temperature hits this or if the wind speed hits this, we're going to actually deploy some capital to go check to make sure things are safe and kind of shore up the ecosystem before they deteriorate. Um, so that's, that's uh, I guess, the, the TLDR. Um, and yeah, that's a little bit of alpha on what Astral has been working on in the, in the, in the depths of the internet for a couple of years now. I, yeah, I suppose, yeah, any, I just, I'll leave that there. And I'm curious for like reactions and I actually, I like, especially uh, poke holes, I mean, poke as many holes as you can. About if you in the future want to build natural capital backed currencies, then as, um, as a backing as collateral, you need something that is in a way transparent, um, that is, uh, of high quality because it is used as a collateral for money that people hopefully use for their day to day transactions. And when these projects like Astral and, and, um, the frameworks, um, you described help with increasing the transparency of these assets and help with like verifying that these assets are actually in place, then this qualifies these assets as good collateral for, for these, for these currencies. And therefore I like the work a lot that, that is, is, um, is being um, done there because in the end, um, for a reserve, we want to have assets that are of high quality, that are relatively efficient, that are transparent in a way that hopefully also are in a way stable. Um, and, that are in a way also liquid so that um, if the reserve at some point would be needed, um, then we can actually use these, these assets behind. And, and with like these, uh, with these um, categories or, or um, yeah, different needs for reserve assets, I think this helps a lot in creating more efficient asset classes. And you also mentioned um, how then, for example, smart contracts can can help um, to to uh, set basically the right incentives and 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 automate. Um, and and I think this is really cool. You can imagine so many things um, that then can be done. Um, we've we've mentioned staking before. You could stake in a way these assets where um, basically the staker takes care of the forest and 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 um, therefore the staking reward is split between the caretaker of the forest and the asset owner and therefore basically um, the the forest is is kept in good condition for example so there's so many things we can build into these types of tokens with this technology that yeah i i think this is actually the place to be in, in, in the whole space. And it was super interesting to see, for example, in this NFT craziness in the past that the creative scene um, got a, a mechanism of ownership of many creative things in music, in art. But now it's probably a, a nature where we can use and apply um, what we've learned about NFTs and, and trees can be NFTs. Um, and and um, therefore, yeah, I, I really th see that this is a, a super cool trend um, going forward, that all these technical primitives now coming together um, and yeah, to build something really nice. This is so exciting for me. I feel 
like this is the kind of zenith of so many different factors converging at once. On one hand, you have Celo, this climate positive, mobile first blockchain focused specifically on onboarding people, you know, who've been excluded from the financial system to date. You've got Collectivo and Astro Protocol and Toucan and Curve Labs exploring how to build local regenerative economic systems to take care of food forests using people on the ground, Internet of Things sensors in the built environment, um, and then remote sensors to add you know, three layers of data to create uh, you know, deep trust and integrity about what we're doing. And so I think my you know, hope is that people can really understand the powerful opportunity here in the refi movement to redesign money so that it regenerates the earth, but also look at not just the planet, but people and the living systems around it and the local contexts to change the relationship that people have with our trees, to change not only the incentives, but also our identity. Because if we can tap into that deep heritage where we understood that we were dependent upon the forest and we needed each other as a community to survive and apply these new tools of technology to create new systems of value exchange, I think we have a shot at addressing these large existential crises of climate change, biodiversity collapse, systemic injustice. And it's a huge challenge, but this is the first time in my life that I genuinely have hope that things are coming together at the right point in time. Wow, this was such an amazing summary and bringing it all together. Um, yeah, perfect. I fully agree. I, I think some of the principles that I'm approaching this from is like p part of it is this like real urgency because of the the aggressive the aggression that rising to the climate crisis like demands, <laughs> um, and then. I also feel like, you know, like I said, I raised the concerns about financializing nature, right? And it's, but part of me is just like, this is inevitable. <laughs> this is, it's already happening. And so we have the opportunity as the first movers to kind of approach this with a level of humility and um, try to anticipate the ways it could go off the rails really and, and and really think that through. And I think one thing that I'm really excited about that it the it seems to be the approach Cello is very much taking is this like progressive scaling, right? And this idea of we need to run these experiments in a very, very risk managed environment because we will get it wrong. These things will fail and they need to fail in a um a place where there's kind of collateral damage is minimized. And then as we get it right, we kind of scale up bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and I think as well, this idea of, of that I think so is getting, getting really right as well of like building with local communities, building with really taking like both jaws of this, like there's the top down kind of like global technological approach. And then there's also the grassroots community driven meeting people, understanding their needs and like somehow creating an organization where those that can kind of take into consideration that those really divergent perspectives. I, I want to touch on this. So I, I'm really excited to see that the folks at Toucan are exploring how to bring our pools into the Celo ecosystem to participate in this beautiful vision of natural backed currencies. Um, how can we get more people building on Celo? Like what's the main reason why people should I mean, build on Celo um, as opposed to anything First of else? all, I think, um, as you said, it, this um this we try um to create cello as the layer one of choice for all these regenerative asset um approaches we've seen out there um because cello is carbon negative and uh, we have like these amazing projects that are already now active um like astra like tukan and and others um and i think um also uh, as you said, the financial inclusion um, aspect of of Celo, this uh, community that is highly mission mission driven, um, I think here uh, helps helps a lot. And then the the use of all these things we are building in future will be on mobile. So I think this mobile first character um, of Celo 
helps as well um, to to bring people on to Celo. Celo is a, a fork of Ethereum. It is EVM compatible. There's a lot of projects that are building out bridges so that Celo is actually fully interoperable with like all the EVM compatible chains out there. Um, we have the stable coins on Celo that, that help not only with like uh, use of uh, or means of payment and and uh, means of like, for for remittances uh, uh, and and other transactions in a stable currency, but they also have this reserve that actually could could buy these assets that we are trying to build on Celo. Um, so I think this is also nice. And yeah, I I think um, the Celo community is still young. It is quickly growing, but we need to get the word out that. This is happening. Therefore, I'm I'm super thankful to yeah for being able to chat with you about all these um, things that are happening now. Because yeah, we would like to excite more people to build on Celo. Um, there is Celo Foundation that is um, giving grants. Um, there's the Climate Collective offering grants and support um, for projects who want to um, build on Celo. And and therefore, yeah, I really hope this this now is a kickstart of a, a of a movement um, and yeah uh, I'm, I'm happy to chat with you about totally and you guys move fast as well so anybody interested in building on cello get in touch with marcus get in touch with the climate collective craig and ed and nirvan there's a bunch of wonderful people on the other side who are really motivated at accelerating meaningful climate impact and yeah positive regenerative work in web3 so thank you marcus for your time today it's been an absolute honor john it's always a pleasure being with you and we look forward to yeah, hopefully another time to check in and see Thanks where this so has gone in john a few months time for for uh, yeah, having me, uh, it was a super interesting conversation, and yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to work together and looking forward to see what what you guys are doing in in, in the space.